So welcome everybody, let's start. Um, let's start with this uh, schools out number 20 already. Um, and this is the, well, it's a happy occasion because this is, the, this is the first schools out since the beginning of Corona that we actually have with a live audience. So uh, that's a double welcome to you all. And we're keeping the, the same format here with um, a speaker and uh, a film afterwards, short film. Uh, and of course, afterwards, the, the bar is open and uh, there's food and there's music, etc. So everything that you know from uh, before. Um, let me just tell you something about um, this moment in time for the Independent School for the City. Uh, we're starting our um, uh, autumn program now. So next month in October, we'll have the uh, course Into the Woods, which is about the, the radical greening of, um, uh, of the city, in this case uh, Rotterdam, and we do that uh, together with Peter Veenstra, who you might know as the landscape architect from Lola. And then in November we have the, the course City of Comings and Goings, which is about migration, uh, and it's based on one of the projects that we did with uh, Crimson, and that produced, amongst others, uh, this panorama, this uh, carpet, uh, and it looks at the city purely from the perspective of uh, migration. Then in December we have one of our skills workshops, which is called uh, Urban Tissue Weaving, and it's actually about weaving. Um, and then the Dirty Old Town, the three-month uh, course that we do in February, March, April next year, has a deadline for the 1st of November. So um, some of you have already done this course. Very happy to see you all back. Uh, but for others, um, yeah, be sure to check it out and uh, uh, if you like it, uh, apply. Um, tonight we are happy to have as our speaker uh, Jan Willem Petersen, um, who is an architect, an urban planner and a researcher, and who traveled um, several times to Afghanistan between 2013 and 2016 uh, to start a self-initiated project uh, to examine the international um, reconstruction efforts in the country, especially in Uruzgan. And he spent several months in this province uh, to examine the legacy of the Dutch reconstruction efforts. Uh, as you might remember, the Dutch army was um, uh, present in Uruzgan for the development and reconstruction of the area until 2010, right? Yeah. And um, his work resulted in the report Uresgan's legacy, an exploration of the Dutch reconstruction results, which he was allowed to hand over to the commander of the armed forces at the time. And the document contains a detailed description and photography of the results of the uh, reconstruction projects undertaken by the task force uh, Uresgan um, during this period of 2006-2010 and it's still the most extensive and detailed study of these uh, reconstruction results of the Netherlands to date. One of the conclusions from the report, I'm not going to be extensive about it because you will probably uh, tell us all about it, but um, was the need to develop new spatial ex expertise in the field of reconstruction. And this conclusion was also endorsed by the Ministry of Defense. So that's a very, um, extraordinary role for uh, architectural research, I would say. And it also formed the basis for a long-term uh, collaboration because uh, for two years now, Jan Willem has been teaching at the Dutch Defense Academy uh, to educate new, gener uh, new generations of officers in design thinking. Uh, defense thus endorses the importance of design as an integral part of the academic curriculum uh, of the up-and-coming um, genists. How do you pronounce it in English? Yeah, the people from the, uh, from the Jenny. Um, and next to that, Jan Willem is working on his PhD at the TU Delft uh, to formulate a manual for the fundamentals of reconstruction in conflict areas. Of course, the reason to invite Jan Willem uh, for this schools out were the recent developments in uh, Afghanistan. And now that the country switched back to the, the <coughs> rule of the Taliban, the question of the value of the reconstruction efforts is back in focus again. Was it all in vain or not? Have the Netherlands and the other countries been building for the Taliban or is there a different way to look at this, uh, at this issue? So uh, and with that, 
I give the floor to you. And of course, if there's uh, questions, well, keep them in mind and uh, you can ask them uh, afterwards. Uh, but for now, Thank go ahead. You. Um, great, I, I uh, thank you for the introduction and a great pleasure to be here. I think uh, before a community who is interested in, uh, let's say, the greater complexities of architecture and also uh, to work somehow in an integral way uh, or to see the discipline in an integral way, uh, not so much a form-finding uh, exercise, but more process-orientated. Um, I've been given 30 plus minutes to take you through Afghanistan and I will try to provide you with some insights in the whole reconstruction endeavors uh, that have uh, changed Afghanistan radically. This is a picture by uh, Jerome Starkey. Uh, it, it was actually the, the initiation and the reason why I went to Afghanistan in the first place. Here you see an array of informal settlements, uh, almost quite literally uh, swept up like a gulf uh, of water uh, on the surrounding mine, uh, mountains uh, of Kabul city, the, the provincial capital uh, uh, of Afghanistan. Uh, but what, what was somehow surprising is that where you normally encounter an organization of informal settlements, uh, they hardly follow the logic of an almost perfect grid. Um, so that, that, that intrigued me uh, in, in the question like what kind of forces are actually unleashed when a city in this case, but also a country, transitions from war to a more relative peace? Uh, and what kind of forces do, uh, in this case, uh, shape city uh, and country? Um, so just to give you an example, um, um, here is the outskirts of Kabul. Kabul uh, uh, expanded enormously uh, after 9-11. And as far as the eye can see, this is a kind of new uh, area being developed by a former warlord, in this case, uh, Marshal Fahim, who, who was actually uh, engaged in the utter destruction of Kabul, but now became part of uh, urban planner. So warlords, which were pr uh, previously um, uh, engaged in fighting, suddenly became uh, urban, planning, uh, urban planners, and that encountered for like three quarters of the city in, uh, in Kabul. Here another example. Um, Previous notorious fighters called commanders um, uh, had such social standing uh, that they started to engage in, in real estate uh, development. So over 600 of these semi-gated uh, communities were developed by former fighters of the battlefield. So they became, um, in a way, the kind of pinnacle of, of urban development on of, of many, many places uh, uh, in, in Afghanistan. But also internationally there were uh, incredible forces shaping the country. And, and just to give you some sort of context, um, both on complex, uh, complexity and, and the, the magnitude and, and, and I would say the uh, colossal endeavor um, uh, that Afghanistan witnessed, uh, this is the, the amount of money America invested in the last 20 years uh, rebuilding uh, the country. So it's almost four times, more than four times the money invested in Germany after the Second World War. So it just gives a scale uh, of what was happening um, in Afghanistan. This is a map of Afghanistan uh, we made with uh, a lot of text, uh, but all the white dots on there are the so-called provincial reconstruction teams. And this was a new concept. The Pentagon initiated military teams, primarily military teams, to engage with reconstruction. Um, that, that is a kind of new concept, hasn't happened before. So Afghanistan became a kind of experimental backyard for uh, a lot of military interventions taking place. The second part which is important is that there are at least 128,000 programs and projects undertaken in Afghanistan. So schools, roads, clinics, 
uh, hospitals, uh, prisons, everything which is kind of backbone of society is being introduced by uh, international forces. Surprisingly, um, even the magnitude of these projects uh, uh, and the kind of physical nature of these projects, design or the discipline, the design discipline is not involved. There are no architects, no urban planners. Um, uh, uh, the, the entire spatial discipline is absent, uh, which, which was rather remarkable uh, uh, given the inherent nature of uh, what they intend to set out to do. In 2010, around 2010, it became quite clear that uh, the reconstruction, uh, nation building as, as it uh, was called at the time, uh, did not quite go according to plan or uh, as uh, might, uh, they might have expected. Uh, here a series of images uh, from the Pentagon, from the US Congress, uh, under oath, taking testimonies, um, about the, the, the kind of uh, unfolding of the, the Afghan reconstruction. So this was for me a kind of starting point to actually actively engage with this whole question of nation building. Could architecture, um, could design contribute to a more successful or uh, outcome or have an impact on this whole nation, uh, notion of nation building? Or even a larger question, uh, which I think is largely still unanswered today, is it even possible to design, rebuild uh, an entire nation um, as one uh, by an international community uh, being the second question? And this is a former US amb uh, ambassador um, speaking his mind about the complexity of this endeavor, uh, like uh, trying to put an outpost on the moon. I think it somehow summarizes the, the complexity of the task at hand. Uh, I might add here that um, having engaged with this subject for quite some time now, uh, introducing design and introducing the role of design is almost as complex like uh, 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 putting a kind of design agenda on a kind of alien planet too. So. Uh, hopefully I can show you some insight that it was relatively uh, successful so far, um, but not without uh, uh, some hard sweat and learned efforts. Afghanistan um, was and still is largely color-coded red, meaning um, travel is uh, uh, by the foreign uh, office is, uh, is not advisable. Uh, yet it was the only way to gain an insight on what the actual impact of our international efforts, but also the Dutch efforts were in, uh, in Afghanistan. So I had to actually physically go to the ground and discover one-to-one -one what the impact was. Till today, there's no real assessment uh, uh, qualitative assessment on what the reconstruction endeavors uh, have achieved, what the actual impact uh, was of all the projects uh, we have introduced there. Um, being a red area, I had to prepare uh, differently. So architects are generally not the ones who are carrying uh, uh, bulletproof vests or uh, this kind of helmets. So I, I associated myself with the kind of uh, um, uh, association of journalists, uh, which were invited by the military to uh, learn how to conduct work in conflict areas. So I, I had to learn, basically, uh, quite extensively how to, to operate uh, in these kind of difficult uh, conditions. Um, this is a passport picture taken uh, in Afghanistan, in Tarankaut, um, of me um, on the first time I went to Urzgan province. Um, so I, I tried to locally blend in as much as possible. Um, uh, in, in this case, um, learning, learning uh, uh, to some extent uh, uh, the language, at least being not 
being not being seen as a foreigner uh, at first hand. Um, and this is not infrequently how you would sleep. So the, the sheer amount of weapons in this room somehow indicate that dressing up as a, a local person, uh, learning about uh, culture, uh, engaging with language is not some kind of a luxury. Uh, it is born out of a necessity to somehow facilitate the kind of first perimeter of, uh, uh, of security. Uh, being able to operate there independently, uh, not being part of a military, not being uh, uh, embedded in, in, in Western uh, forces, uh, but to operate there uh, solo. Um, here an example, um, there's an image like Spot, Spot the Dutchman. Um, uh, these are the tribal, uh, some of the tribal el elders in Gizab, a very, very remote district in Uruzgan province. It's I, I arguably one of the more um, remote parts of uh, Afghanistan. Um, and by this way of conducting work, I was able to stay with families uh, for a length uh, amount of time uh, and therefore get a different perspective on uh, what was unfolding on the ground. Uh, it's quite different than the report, it's quite different than uh, being part of a military um, uh, which, which um, uh, encounters all kind of security uh, threats, therefore cannot l stay very long in a particular area. Uh, so to embed locally uh, was a very important tool to uh, get a kind of clear idea um, about the outcomes of, uh, of some of the, the projects uh, the Holland has undertaken. Um, very specifically, um, I looked at the Dutch mission, 2006-2010. Uh, 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 we have conducted many, many uh, uh, reconstruction projects uh, and I was able to visit around 50 uh, uh, of them uh, during a course of two months, um, being on the, on the ground. And I've selected uh, a few um, to highlight uh, some of the outcomes. This is a kind of returning question for already quite some time. Um, were all efforts in vain? This was not so long ago, so even before Taliban took over. Did our soldiers die for, for, uh, for nothing? Um, it's a returning question uh, because there's so little insight what is actually being achieved. Um, I try to answer uh, from a spatial perspective um, for a, a small part um, this, this aspect. Here you see the kind of provincial capital, Tarankaut, um, as military forces encountered them in 2006. Uh, this is the situation, how it looked. Um, this is the situation in uh, 2010, um, where you see a kind of radical difference. Um, so on a kind of regional scale, on a kind of the development uh, of, of this place, um, tremendous steps are being made. Almost all institutional buildings are there put in place by Western forces. Um, I think that this kind of overall development is, uh, is hard to, uh, uh, to counter even in, in today's condition. But looking very specifically at um, certain projects, um, there's a kind of uh, different, diff different uh, aspect. Um, here a school, the so-called Baraksai school, being left uh, abandoned. Here, a bridge towards the Derawood area uh, being utterly demolished by flush uh, floods uh, because construction was so poor. So overall, this is a bit the, the kind of outcome summary of what uh, our Dutch efforts uh, resulted in. Uh, between 15 and 20 percent were relatively successful, meaning that the expectations we had or the targets and the goals we set were more or less met. Uh, projects were therefore relatively uh, uh, successful and contributed kind of to a longer term development of, uh, of Uruzgan. Uh, 
the red, 40%, was inherently not. Uh, they were destroyed, never finished, uh, uncompleted, uh, not in use, uh, etc. And the middle part is more interested. So like, yeah, projects were in operation, but not as we foreseen. Um, is this very interesting? I'm not so sure. Uh, but this is a kind of summary of, of what the outcomes are, uh, were. What, what's much more interesting is like, what are the underlying reasons that some of the projects were uh, successful and others were not? Um, and I've tried to highlight just a couple of them uh, given the time frame, but there, there are legions of, of uh, many, many, many uh, examples, uh, endless examples um, uh, of lessons to be learned. Uh, I've just selected a couple. Um, here you stand on a, a hill in the um, uh, Baluchi uh, Valley, uh, an area which was heavily combated. Um, a former outpost of the, of the Netherlands, uh, Punchak. Uh, this is more an, ar an area uh, where you see in the foreground some Afghan uh, houses. Totally in the back on this kind of mud hill, you see the, the little outpost. And in the foreground, you see a school uh, or what remains of the school. Um, this is a school conducted, uh, uh, initiated by the provincial reconstruction team in, the, in this kind of uh, heavily uh, uh, fought over area uh, to support the population. Uh, this is the kind of result of that school when I visited, uh, totally ruined. Uh, what is very interesting about this school is that the reason why this building um, was registered of being non-successful non or being uh, destroyed was uh, went down in history as uh, Taliban being in opposition of education. Um, the reality is actually that the moment the Dutch forces left their kind of outpost, uh, coming back to Holland, uh, the local population dismantled this building uh, because of the use of materials. So they have used steel beams, they have used windows with uh, wooden window frames with glass. There were kind of rarities in this kind of very impoverished area. So the local population saw uh, a much more useful utility for materials being deployed and uh, them being deployed in houses, in their own like houses like this. So they would be, be sold on local markets and, and put to use in uh, their own houses. So it's, it's important um, to understand this very bizarre aspect because we see, we as um, Western forces, saw the failure of this project as ideological opposition. The reality is actually that the practical use of material uh, uh, is the underlying uh, uh, problem here. So, and that problem is much easier to fix than fix than ideological opposition uh, by uh, by Taliban. Another example in uh, Chora uh, district. This is uh, the, the capital there, Ali Shirzai. Um, a school building which was in place, very successfully uh, restored. Many uh, children go to school. Uh, sitting under uh, um, um, uh, the trees, as I, I've heard. Uh, this is on a very small distance, a new school. A uh, girls' school being constructed. And this is a boys' school being there uh, constructed. And you see already the cracks and the, um, uh, the building falling, uh, falling apart. Um, what I noticed is that there were five schools being built in an area of one square kilometer in a village which had no more than 3,000 people. Um, and that's kind of a, a peculiar density uh, uh, for this kind of population. Um, so reconstruction efforts there were put in place by the local governor, uh, not to further education, but as a kind of excuse to facilitate uh, Western reconstruction efforts, like please please put it uh, around here, almost as a kind of uh, graveyard of projects, fully knowing that these projects uh, will never be uh, uh, utilized by um, uh, 
the local community. So they were put there purely for uh, satisfaction reasons and, and, and local employment. Um, you wonder, like, how come? How come this, is, this kind of uh, goes unnoticed? Uh, the main reason is the white building. Uh, the white building is the government compound. It's, a, it's one of the few concrete buildings. It's also the building where the provincial reconstruction team, meaning military, took temporary shelter. So they were partners in the same building as the governor. Um, the governor had control who accessed this kind of compound. So every, the, the local population who knew that something was uh, uh, not uh, uh, going as supposed to uh, go, they knew of the misconduct, uh, they would simply not be allowed in to inform um, uh, a provincial reconstruction team um, that, that uh, effort should be or could be uh, differently spent. And he, he, you see what they call the kind of shura, uh, a meeting between elders uh, uh, and the governor, uh, by which uh, only befriended uh, people would be able to enter. So there's a lesson to learn, like where, where do you sit as a kind of uh, team who is engaging with reconstruction? Do you very closely sit to local authorities, or do you sit independently and have a kind of uh, lower threshold? Uh, and gain information, insight, and conduct analysis. Um, another example uh, in the Chora Valley, this is an example the Australians built, uh, a bridge which is still operating uh, today. Uh, but very close by, there's a, um, a, a small village, a couple of households, who built this building. Um, they intended to build a school themselves, raise money locally, um, fully knowing that education for the children might be uh, beneficial, uh, give their village uh, standing uh, versus other villages. Uh, this is how we encountered it, uh, and you see the, the military person uh, for the first time. There was a great pressure to deliver reconstruction, to somehow demonstrate to the local population uh, that we're there to bring good, to, uh, to do good, bring development. Uh, so this building went unnoticed on the radar of uh, uh, military forces. Uh, this is how I encountered it. On the right hand side, you see a very small patch of white. That's this building. It is another school building. So we have built a school building next to an already existing school building without knowing it. Um, that building is now also falling apart. Once again, how come uh, that uh, this occurred, this took place? And the local elders were consulted by uh, military teams, like what, what would you uh, desire, what are your needs here? And they said, like, well, you know, you're a Westerner, you know how to build decent schools, please build us a school. Uh, and so they did, not knowing that they, by doing so, they have rendered uh, the kind of community effort to raise their own school uh, redundant. So this became a state school, uh, obviously being funded central government, central government being uh, incredibly difficult uh, getting financial means to a local province, let alone to such a small uh, village. So it, 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 uh, it resulted in this building not being um, uh, funded anymore, uh, but in, in the process also eliminated every kind of community effort to um, uh, build something themselves. A returning issue is uh, prisoners of war. This is a, a house which was temporarily um, uh, organized as a, as a prison. So the people you hear, are, uh, you see they are prisoners. Uh, incredibly cramped, uh, all but desirable conditions. Uh, them living underground uh, uh, to sleep. Uh, so a sit situation that needed to be solved if prisoners were the, the Dutch took would be handed over to local, um, local authorities given the Geneva Convention. 
So we we built a new provincial prison, which is this is one of the five buildings um, we built for exactly that purpose. Um, but something peculiar happened there. Um, this is an Afghan guard, uh, this is his house, but this room, this place was actually intended as a kind of working room. Much as we would go to office, have a desk, do our kind of office work, uh, it's designed as, as that. Um, in Afghanistan, a guard uh, generally doesn't come from the local province given security reasons. Um, his family could be under threat, he could be forced to do all sorts of things, releasing prisoners, etc. So these people come from a different part of Afghanistan. Therefore, they don't have a house to go to uh, outside office hours. So all these kind of uh, office rooms became actually dormitories um, for, for uh, the prison community, uh, the prison guard community. As a result, a lot of buildings which were intended for prisoners and facilities like a guest house, kitchen facilities, recreation, a mosque, etc., were occupied by these prisoners, uh, the prison guards, because they had no space left. Um, as a result, uh, prisoners were cramped in this building and had literally the same amount of freedom uh, movement space as uh, the, the previous condition where they came from. So yes, the building is in better shape, yes it is concrete and, and uh, kind of uh, lasting, but the actual intention of, of creating a facility uh, up to international standards uh, is largely lost because of the mismatch, because not understanding uh, local realities and, and using a kind of, uh, a kind of a generic approach uh, um, for this kind of building. One of my more, more favorite uh, and I would say illustrative examples um, is this. Is, this is the, the small village, Shorg Maghab. Um, a new hospital is introduced, a new mosque is introduced, a new school is introduced. It's the blue building. There's a souk, uh, a local market being built up uh, as a kind of a, a, a new, new uh, district center. In order to secure uh, a, a largely uh, a large area, many police posts had to be built. Um, six in total, and this is an example south of Tarenkaut, the provincial capital. This police post is built on the hilltop where you see the guard towers overlooking a certain terrain, uh, has a, having a kind of strategic effect. And if you compare that layout and the design of this one, it's identical to this one. Uh, this one laying next to the kind of uh, Sorg Maghab village I just show you. However, here the kind of uh, tower guards are rendered redundant uh, because of the very location. They have not built them on top of a kind of hill, but on the kind of hill foot, uh, resulting in the fact that on top of the hill a kind of temporary police outpost had to be built overlooking uh, the, the kind of police post themselves uh, for security purposes. So it just shows that the kind of generic use of generic blueprints uh, and, and, and rubber stamp them in a kind of particular area uh, uh, has this kind of uh, undesirable um, effect. Another component which became more urgent and uh, more uh, prominent uh, in recent events is uh, uh, not so much the reconstruction project as they intend to have a de development uh, perspective, but the actual military uh, infrastructure itself. Uh, what they, they call this the deployment force infrastructure. Uh, this is an example of Bagram Air Base, uh, the largest uh, US base in uh, Afghanistan. There are more than 800 military bases built in Afghanistan in the last uh, 20 years. Some very small, uh, but some a scale of this kind of uh, small town of uh, over 60, uh, 40,000 uh, people. Oh. Uh, that base was departed not so long ago uh, in the night uh, without kind of any meaningful transfer uh, to local authorities. Um, in the middle of the night, Americans left uh, without giving any word. 
uh, to their counterpart, um, enabling the base to be looted by the local community. Uh, this, is, this is the legacy. This is what is left behind. Is this unique? No, it's not unique. Um, this is uh, Camp Bastion, the largest uh, UK base in Helmand Province, uh, have uh, 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 fiercely fought over uh, province. Uh, again, over 30,000 people here, uh, an entire new town being uh, built. This is, um, these are some images, how it's uh, being handed over to Afghan forces. Um, formerly uh, highly functioning uh, facilities uh, being abandoned. This was the kind of local hospital, which was one of the most specialized hospitals in the southern uh, sphere of Afghanistan, where uh, traumatized, uh, heavily uh, heavy casualties would be treated. Uh, this in the below picture is how it's left. Um, one would say utterly useless uh, for local uh, communities or uh, the host nation itself. Um, here you see the transfer, the bo uh, above picture, uh, aerial satellite images, um, how it was being built or incrementally uh, expanded over time. It took around 60 million dollars to build uh, this camp. To dismantle, and we call this redeployment, uh, took more than 350 million uh, US dollars. So almost six times as much to uh, ship uh, it back, um, take materials back than it was to initially build the place. So it raises a whole uh, set of questions. Uh, what to do with the military infrastructure itself, both in terms of its legacy, uh, but both how uh, this kind of uh, massive uh, footprints that are, are being built uh, potentially also could contribute to reconstruction endeavors during a mission. This is uh, a Dutch camp, Camp Holland. Um, remember this kind of funny shape outline. The bottom, the Afghan forces um, that were um, eventually uh, take over um, uh, the entire camp. Uh, Australians, the Dutch part in the middle and the above part Americans and special forces. Um, why is this important? Here, just a sheer scale. Here in the bottom, you see the, the, and the camp outline. Uh, above, you see the kind of footprint of Tarenkaut, the, the city itself. So in essence, we have built a, a second city, duplicated an entire city. Um, when Holland departed, ended their mission uh, under political pressure, uh, there was a kind of relatively hasty retreat. Uh, they have handed the, uh, the base over to Americans and Australians. They have handed the base in, in turn over to Afghan forces. So where this camp would at this peak house more than 6,000 6, people, um, by the time uh, this base was being handed over, there were like between 300 and 600 local people. Now, uh, so a large part of this um, was um, being left literally as a ghost town. Uh, now this whole compound has been taken over by Taliban forces. But even when we um, think about legacy of this infrastructure design, um, this kind of in infrastructure differently, um, this is a smaller camp, Dutch camp, Camp Hadrian, um, which you see on the left side, which we totally dismantled. So even when you intend to leave a kind of zero waste footprint principle, this is the kind of uh, uh, um, uh, stuff you leave behind. So even when, when there is a kind of relative care to take everything back, uh, to make sure that the place is rendered as uh, more or less as it were, um, it's still not a very pr pretty picture. And, and the next you see an American base uh, repeating that process uh, uh, again. Uh, being left uh, left there now with the total retreat of uh, Afghan forces. Um, so important issues to address, um, uh, which I try to address. Um, uh, I, I, I wrote them all down. 
uh, made this report, was able to hand it over to the Chief of Defense, uh, former Defense, uh, uh, Tom Middendorp. Um, some of the insights which I just could show you briefly uh, and the lessons that must be learned for this kind of recon uh, reconstruction efforts um, were endorsed. Uh, it enabled a kind of longer uh, process where I, I'm now tasked to draft a reconstruction manual for um, uh, the Dutch military. Here you see an engagement in the Houses of Parliament uh, where politicians are actually susceptible of, of uh, some of the insights um, uh, of the impact, the actual impact of the, the, the Dutch reconstruction project. Um, also there, uh, still lessons need to be learned. Uh, there's still no official evaluation of the Dutch uh, mission, which is uh, uh, remarkable. Um, As a, 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 as a result of this, this whole process, I'm still engaged and part of the NATO team, drafting a kind of new doctrines, how to, uh, um, how to actually redesign the military compound uh, to leave a more kind of uh, responsible and meaningful uh, legacy as we, uh, we, we currently do. And the reason why I, I show this um, is, is not so much um, to outline the direction the project has, has uh, taken or actually the, the, the many years that have been invented, uh, invested in it, uh, but more or less also as an encouragement to the, the community uh, at large to really embrace the relatively complex issues uh, that are slightly beyond our traditional field of, of working. And I hope that some of the things I highlight or that some of the tangible products and outcomes and, and uh, positive effects that uh, uh, architectural analysis uh, and design can bring um, uh, um, as a kind of encouragement to, to engage with this kind of subject. So I would like to maybe leave it uh, at that and, and uh, have a kind of discussion maybe on uh, I, I'm sure many questions of it will, uh, uh, will follow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe uh, everybody sort of gather your questions and maybe I can start with uh, one or two. Um, what I find... Um, uh, really fascinating for this um, uh, research that you did is that you, well, it's kind of adventurous to go there in the first place, of course, uh, but yet that you reconstructed all the stories behind the, um, uh, the efforts, the buildings, the schools, etc., and not only look like are they successful or not, but why are they successful or not. Um, at the same time, it shows that the reasons for success are not very uniform. They're different every time. Sometimes it's this warlord, sometimes it's people who are poor, sometimes it's this uh, not knowing that there is already a school, yeah. etc. So it's so detailed. Um, now, at the same time, you are uh, giving advice and you're making this sort of handbook of the fundaments of uh, reconstruction in, in uh, uh, conflict areas. So how does that relate to each other? You want to give advice, but at the same time, uh, you know that everything is so site-specific. Um, what kind of things are, is, is it possible to actually advise on? Yeah, so I, I, I think I, I try to counter that by doing actually a number of things. One is to provide, uh, let's say, generic overarching fundamentals fully knowing that a kind of blueprint of how to conduct missions are virtually impossible. Uh, but at the moment, there is no such thing. Uh, not only in the Netherlands, but internationally, there is no kind of uh, uh, tangible, practical guidance on how to conduct some of the uh, reconstruction projects. So th these are kind of overarching. Hmm. The, the, the second bit is to have a kind of almost checklist, which is the hardest part, um, to uh, not so much 
uh, uh, outline, if you take step one, two, three, four, five, six, your result will become X. But at least frame the questions uh, that, that come, uh, the more difficult questions that come with project development. So an example of that being um, provincial reconstruction team initially started to engage with the local community. So yes, they went out mm -hmm. and it's like, oh, what are your urgent needs and where would you like to place your school, etc. So they, they thought that was a very robust way of um, surveying and, and, and actually meeting local demand. Um, they did not know, they did not encounter, fo have the follow-up questions, why are you actually asking for school and who belongs this piece of land to and etc. etc. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole scope of underlying questions that somehow need to be uh, addressed to come to a successful project. Mm -hmm. So th there's a kind of uh, uh, checklist element and there are kind of case studies to frame a particular mindset. Now where it becomes really interesting and, and I think uh, uh, inherently challenging is that the, 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 there, there is a certain schizophrenia to it. So in, on one hand side it's like, yes, please do build local, please tailor locally, etc. But the expectation of local population is not to have something they're already familiar with. They want something they're slightly unfamiliar with, a higher standard, a higher yeah. thing they have seen in Dubai or whatever. So the expectations are beyond. So there's a kind of balancing act between like uh, uh, one hand side, uh, uh, deliver new, um, new, new kind of project, but also like uh, not having the foundations uh, or, or a relationship of any kind of uh, what, what previously existed and at the same time be very aware of what is locally possible and, and, and that's kind of a balancing act. So even by outlining these two variables uh, structurally next to each other, I, I think at least you have the scope where, you, where your, your balancing act uh, hmm. uh, is as a kind of... Uh, but that is also an argument for saying that architecture matters in this uh, reconstruction effort. Because if people expect something which looks slightly different or which is a reflection of modernity as they understand it, uh, it is part of uh, architectural design, right? Yes, correct. So I, I think that the, the, the biggest achievement uh, so far, or the biggest joy is, is that the, this, the, the notion of design and the importance of design is seeping through. Mm -hmm. So the very fact that you know, you're teaching to, to officers the very notion that um, it's being drafted now by an architect, the very notion that an architect uh, as, is part of a nation, a NATO uh, draftsman team, mm -hmm. reframing certain kind of doctrines, um, is important as a kind of... Um, uh, um, I would say crucial aspect that 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 hinges some of the the, the existing uh, content towards a more sustainable content, and I, I think that that is that is acknowledged, and um, therefore greatly satisfying to be be integral work yeah. in truly matter in a kind of comprehensive way. And that's also the reason why you teach design thinking at the military academy. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it, at first it was a kind of uh, experiment and it was uh, uh, project-based and now it becomes more more integral part of their kind of curriculum that design thinking uh, is not only critical, it, 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 I think it's essential to prevent some of the stuff we have seen uh, in the 2006 era. Mm. Uh, and I think they're very fortunate, it's, it's not only acknowledged, it's also that there's a great willingness of the new kind of generational officers to think more uh, broader, broader sense than purely military. Mm. And I, I think that's a mind shift that uh, uh, needs to be taken um, further. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> Any other questions? Someone? Or else I have some. Well, yeah?
Yes, yeah, so, so twofold. I think one, uh, obviously, the, the most, uh, I mean, it's a selection, so there's a whole array of, of projects uh, that, that has been articulated. Uh, I think, obviously, the most, um, the, the cases that one can learn most of and must learn most of are the kind of least successful projects. Um, the reasoning behind it. Um, um, are, are most intriguing. Um, the project that, for instance, was very successful is a kind of uh, technical school which was there. And one of the reasons I think uh, it was very successful um, because they had a very dedicated project team, uh, uh, project management team on it. So um, it, it, it was one of the four projects that the, the Holland uh, outsourced to a kind of German uh, company. Uh, and they had a, pro a project team and they, they followed the, up the project throughout many years. Uh, they have approached the project not only as a kind of physical built entity, but also make sure that uh, teachers' contracts were in place and, you know, for long term, uh, that even teachers would come to a kind of remote province as Aarhus Khan, which is unsafe, etc. They arranged housing accommodations for teachers, so the whole operation of the school could actually be conducted. So the very sense uh, that that uh, uh, to to approach the project not only technically but more comprehensively was, I think, part of the success of uh, such project. Um, how it will unfold now, I think, is very interesting because of the, of course, transition to a new government, uh, Taliban government. Uh, I uh, much to be said about it, but I think the the it's a very very interesting moment uh, because they, f I, I predict they will face a very very difficult time uh, governing the country. Um, they, they have done so previously. They were notoriously bad in governing the country economically, in infrastructure projects, in all the kind of necessities that, that come from it. Uh, and they will face similar issues now, even with all Western forces being pulled out, but also Western resources being pulled out. So they will face a tremendous uh, uh, challenge to facilitate education, facilitate economy, facilitate industrial development, all the things in essence which Western uh, paths uh, um, uh, had ambitions for. Uh, they, they did not change. I mean, people want development. Uh, uh, even Taliban wants to see uh, development. Um, so the, the questions remain there, and I think the, uh, uh, it, it potentially provides a more suitable ground to actually deliver uh, development, given that it's relatively peaceful. Um, it's organized, uh, it, there's no conflict, uh, and therefore the, the kind of uh, um, time aspect that you could spend in relative ease on a project uh, uh, is larger. Um, uh, uh, the weapons are largely gone from the battlefield, so the whole, dyna the whole dynamic is different and therefore it opens up, I think, a more sustainable um, way for project development to take place. So if they, you still have a, uh, a lot of uh, friends and people that you know, pro probably also Taliban in, uh, in Afghanistan, um, if they would invite you as a consultant for their urban planning uh, endeavors, would you go? I, 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 pff, a difficult question, but I think uh, if there's a sincere and, and uh, uh, and, and a sincere contribution to be made and to have a real 
real sustained impact um, in an area, city development, etc., I would definitely consider it, yes. Because it seems like um, all the projects that, uh, that you've shown, um, they were part of uh, collective services, right? Like we are, uh, like the, the schools, the, the common good projects, yeah, really. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but also some of the projects that were, well, basically less successful were uh, because they presented an image of progress that maybe the population didn't want. For instance, the, yeah. the school with yeah. the, the floor for, yes. for a girls' school, and yeah. that remained empty. So um, you could imagine that the Taliban had a completely different program for their reconstruction development. It's, it's interesting because um, there's this huge misconception, uh, I, I believe, in, in, in terms of even now, like, um, how success is articulated, like, yeah, okay, military, the whole nation building effort has failed, but let's, uh, let us not forget that, you know, so many more school, girls went to school, and etc. It has never been the intention of the international community to uh, uh, somehow build schools for schools and fight for women's rights, etc. That has always been kind of part of the kind of larger endeavor. So, but now it's pinpoint as that this is the true progress and that's something we should hold on to. Um, however, uh, um, uh, um, admirable. Um, the reason why I say is that also at the time when I came first to Urzgan, it's like, yeah, girls have no education. And then it's like, then you encounter a girls' school. It's like, so, well, actually, no one knew there was a girls' school in, in, in uh, Urzgan. Um, a lot of opposition uh, to education of girls um, by Taliban was never ideological. It was like uh, the, the way it was done mixing girls and boys together was a problem. It's not the education itself in many, many instances. So by the time that it was separated, which, uh, uh, there were no real, real issues. A lot of education being facilitated in Tanakao now is in Madrasa. So yes, the state, state schools are, some of them are really uh, successful, but the overall majority is Madrasa. Of course, the, the religious schools, uh, that's something we generally don't like to see as education because that's where kind of Taliban fighters will come from and, and radicalism in, Thai, in Thai, Pakistan, etc. So the, 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 this, this notion of madrasa is heavily uh, poisoned. Mm. But therefore, for kids to, to learn uh, language, uh, speak, write, etc. Uh, okay, you know, th there's a whole discussion to be had, but, yeah. uh, you know, at least acknowledge that this is there. Yeah. Someone else, maybe, who has a question? Otherwise, I'd like to uh, thank you again for your, uh, for your lecture and uh, to be continued, I suppose. For sure. Thanks. Sure. Thanks. Thank Is there a question? Sorry. Oh. Are there still ongoing projects? Like, apparently, all the forces were pulled out. What is now? There were probably some onboard projects. Yeah, so there, the, 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 there were a number of things. So you, 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 they have a huge scope of projects. Uh, some large part is military initiated, provincial reconstruction team. Of course, next to it, there are all sorts of NGOs doing, uh, doing projects. I know uh, quite some NGOs are invited back to the country to continue, especially med medical uh, uh, facilities. So, um, uh, but militarily, I think there's no one uh, conducting. I know the Foreign Affairs has projects, long-term um, investments, um, but I think that's, that's probably on hold given the kind of transfer of government, also not knowing where, which kind of course Taliban will, uh, will take. Yeah, so they're, they're a part of it. So a lot of NGOs are, are uh, uh, not a lot, but there are NGOs now being invited back to uh, provide health facilities um, um, uh, that I know of. So, but I think at, at least a lot of stuff is on hold in, uh, in Afghanistan, especially financially. So yeah, the project will follow when 
uh, resources are being made available again. Yes, so I, I think, uh, let's say that that's a kind of personal stance towards the profession. I think it's, uh, there's always a quest and a search to, to see what architecture uh, could be and what, uh, how architecture as a profession could contribute to kind of overall more complex um, questions. Um, I was introduced to Afghanistan by a friend uh, who introduced me to a local family who embraced me as one of their, theirs and from there on I built a kind of network and uh, um, slowly expanded into more uh, contested areas. Uh, once again I think that this kind of notion that there's a kind of anti-western attitude uh, among the, the, the Afghan population uh, I never encountered it, and I dare to say it's non-existent. So there, there is no, um, there, there, there's literally no hatred uh, towards uh, um, uh, uh, foreign aspects. I will, even the contrary, they have a very uh, honorable code, Pashtuali. They, um, uh, and even the, the kind of, uh, if you knock on a kind of stranger's door, they will, they will house you, they facilitate you, they will provide you shelter, food, etc. So it's a kind of level of uh, hospitality we, we are, in, I think, generally in the West unfamiliar with. Uh, so that was, that was actually great and I think a lot of people were, uh, especially the younger generation, were incredibly brave to somehow um, take me in and, and show me some of the locations and places which were very hardly accessible. Uh, to show a part of the reconstruction and show the actual impact of the reconstruction uh, uh, in an effort to improve uh, on it. So there's a lot of engagement to, to uh, rebuild the country and, and try to make the best out of it. Um, culturally, I said like I had to prepare um, uh, in terms of customs, in terms of language, uh, I tried to learn as much as possible uh, before even going to Afghanistan. About a picture, I've been looking at the picture for like 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Is that, is that a pool? Is yeah. That, yeah. It's, 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 it's correct. I think this is a um, one of the things I, I did. Uh, when, when you're there, you, you, you somehow um, make short term mm -hmm. missions, short term trips on this is what I'm going to do today or in this week or in the next few days. Um, this is a kind of small police outpost, so along um, there was a road being constructed, Kandahar, important city in the south, to Tarankaut. So it's the only access road to the province. Uh, along that road are 106 kind of police posts built uh, by various nations and various constructions, etc. And it's like, well, it's a really uh, pointless endeavor, but nevertheless fun to visit them all. So I'm gonna have a road trip and I, every row, every post, I, so every two kilometers you stop. And then you, you are invited with Afghan people and they will offer you tea again and you have to stay there and eat and uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I, I have the whole series of these kind of uh, posts and they all look different. Um, some are uh, under the ground, some made a whole kind of Eden garden, some, uh, make this kind of swimming pool, some look more like Vietnam era, uh, kind of uh, sandbagged. Um, but the, 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 so nice series of photos and stories to tell your children and so. But what was really uh, uh, intriguing is that you learn the level of security. So what we see as security, even now, is like, well, there are 300,000 Afghan army people who are securing this on X amount of bases, and this being one of them, they, they had no food, 
they had to go to the local village to pursue it themselves. They had no electricity, so they had to bargain a kind of battery to have one light, uh, some on the flagpole, so they could oversee vaguely uh, there was a kind of uh, uh, approaching uh, um, uh, adversaries. Um, they had normally like uh, four, five, six rounds of ammunition uh, each, uh, and 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 you know, the, the, I was very kindly escorted by uh, uh, former warlords um, who brought bags of ammunition with him. And I was like, my God, you know, what are we going to do? We go on a kind of uh, in a kind of war zone, and it was a kind of way to the hospitality to show, like, I have staff to ensure that you are safe. And, and I only understood this kind of relationship uh, while going through the motions. So they start swapping ammunition because their ammunition grade was so much lower, the quality, than the ammunition we had. So it's like, ooh, and they were, they were incredibly thrilled with that. So then you understand, like, well, this is the level of, of um, system we put our trust in, and the system which is incredibly human. And it's, it's, it's not the kind of large uh, narrative you see, the kind of general speak in the kind of Pentagon press conferences. This is, this is reality. Mm -hmm. So then, then it becomes all very uh, tangible. Architecturally very interesting, like, yeah. uh, you know, this is, this is the local air conditioning uh, system where the water drips in the bushes and therefore there's kind of cooling down and there are kind of birds inside and, you know, they have the kind of daylight, uh, the daytime music, et cetera, et cetera. So you learn an extensive amount just by having this kind of uh, highly enjoyable uh, road trip along hundreds of these police paths. Did they make a tour and then hope it's going to rain? Or where did you get the water from? Carry it up the mountain every day. So they, they, some, some were strategically placed high yeah. on the mountaintops yeah. overlooking. So every day they had to go down like half a day yeah. uh, and, and come up. So it's, it's uh, I mean, it's endurance, pure, pure endurance. So uh, not being paid, not having food, not having uh, uh, difficult. And then, of course, they have mobile phones and they are being called like, hey, we're going to get you and you, you have six bullets. And it's like, well, you know, I, I just walk away and you can have your post. And by the time you're done, I come back because it's my job. And, and this kind of stuff happened all the time without any kind of fighting. It's, it's a kind of uh, uh, cat and mouse game. Now that we're talking about the photography, I was wondering, because your pictures are not uh, too purely to document things, right? It also seems like you want to convey something of this uh, peculiar, well, beauty or aesthetics of the, of the place. Is that right? Yeah, so some, some of the, the pictures I took, I mean, maybe this series is one of them, um, uh, highlight particularly realities which are um, I, I fell in love with, and you know, it, it, it's so warm, and, 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 and against every odd, they, 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 they share, they resist, they, they, they're incredibly brave. Um, other pictures are much more straightforward in, 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 in documentation, but a very pure purpose of um, they prove to have incredible value, especially in the political domain. Mm. Like, well, when I was in Parliament, um, showing some of the projects not working is yes, but you know there's always a level of uh, uh, there's always a but you know you should not forget and, and it might work and it cannot be so bad and uh, this and this and it just showed a picture like literally it's totally destroyed. This building will never ever operate again, and it's like okay, it's a one example. And so well, I have another forty piles of schools laying exactly the same. So your report is actually saying we were we encountered Urzgan's thirty three schools and we actually went to two hundred eighty eight. So there's a difference between two hundred fifty four schools being uh, constructed by Western forces. Uh, like see, the density of schools is actually quite comparable to the density in Holland. So what have we done? You know, uh, qualitatively, uh, we don't know. In, in terms of quantity, yes, we can say, well, look, it's, it's all there. So by even showing an X amount, actually an endless supply of photographs for each kind of example, um, it, it, you, you, you somehow uh, make a convincing argument that there are, there are lessons to be learned uh, uh, and, and there are lessons that must be learned. And, and then you're quite solid on the table to say, 
to answer the follow-up question, how? And, and, and can you help? And, and that's, that's a bit the kind of uh, um, process we, we had. Yeah. Thanks again. Thank you. <laughs>